All right. Good to have everybody back, and uh, we're going to jump right in where we left off in Daniel chapter 3. And uh, we were in verse 5, so we'll just keep right on going, go on into verse 6. And those of you watching on television, again, we always like to remind you that we're independent. I'm not associated with any group, and uh, yes, I'm just a cattle rancher, and uh, it's baby arriving time, so I love my ranching, and I love the cattle, but I love this even more. So uh, it uh, kind of amuses people that uh, I'm a cattle rancher and still am doing what I'm doing with the Word of God, but God has seen fit to uh, bless us with both sides of the coin, honey, honey. And uh, we, we do. We love our ranching. And when we are out in these cities and all week in Florida last week, my, what a joy to drive up our hill to the, to the ranch. So uh, we just praise the Lord for everything. All right. Daniel, chapter 3. And we've been talking about this horrible image that Nebuchadnezzar raised out there on the plains of the Euphrates Valley. And uh, no wonder, no wonder, David would rather, uh, Daniel would rather go to the lion's den as fall down and worship such a vile, immoral image. All right, verse 6. So Nebuchadnezzar puts out the decree, whosoever falleth not down and worship this image, the same shall be cast into the midst of the burning fire. Okay, I'm sorry, I said lion's den. This is into the fiery furnace first. Therefore, at that time, when the decree goes out through the whole empire, that everyone now has to pay homage to this image that's been raised by old Nebuchadnezzar. Now, like I showed you, you know, three score cubits, that's 60 and uh, 30, that's about 90 feet tall, see? And uh, six feet, or six cubits across, so it's quite in a humongous, humongous thing. Verse 7, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the music, I'm not going to list all the music, and the all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down. Now, I know that not everybody from every nation, but like we saw earlier, they're governmental representatives. See, it's just like when we have a big deal in Washington, whether it's the funeral of an ex-president or like our inauguration day. See, every nation on earth sends representatives, and I think that's what's we got pictured here. It isn't that everybody on earth was there, but all their representatives, all their government wheels, from all the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. All right, now verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near. Now, remember what the Chaldeans were. They were the top dogs of all the soothsayers. They, they were a sort of a little clique all their own. <clears throat> so the Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now, don't lose sight of the fact the Jews have been taken out of their homeland several years previous to all this, and they've now been relocated to the country of Babylon, which is present-day Iraq. All right? And so these Jews, not just Daniel and his three friends, but probably multitudes of them, were not taking part in bowing down to this image. Now, I think it bears repeating in one of our previous programs, now after we started the book of Daniel, there were two reasons that God used Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to invade and defeat the Israelites and take them captive to Babylon for 70 years. The first one, you remember, was they had not kept the seven-year sabbatical, which meant from the time that they went in and occupied the land under Joshua, they were to let the productive part of Israel, that is the farmland and the orchards and what have you, to lie fallow every seventh year. It was called the sabbatical year. But they never did. 490 years, they never kept a single sabbatical. So what did God say? I'm going to get it. And so he uprooted them, and the land laid utterly desolate, unproductive for 70 years. But the other major reason for God dealing so drastically with Israel was they had fallen so far into idolatry. 
unbelievable in spite of all the warnings. Now let's go back where we left off in the last program. I've been debating whether to go back and finish that or not. But let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 because, see, this is so intrinsic in our understanding how God does or why God does the things that he does. Well, it's not because he was unkind or that he was ruthless, but he had to control the behavior of the human race some way or other. So now when you come back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and... Uh, and Moses is more or less, in one instance, he's reviewing, and then on the other hand, he's looking forward to the time when Israel would come in and occupy the land of Canaan. And he knows it's going to happen because, well, like down at verse 12, Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep unto them, that the Lord thy God will keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swore to the Father. He will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee and give thee all these things, see? And they will be blessed beyond measure. But the warning was, don't fall into their idolatry. Because that God can't stomach. And did they? Yes. My, I've shown you Jeremiah 44 over and over through the years. At the time of Jeremiah, which was just before the Babylonian captivity, who were they worshiping? The Queen of Heaven. And what was the worship of the Queen of Heaven? The grossest immorality, see? All right, but back here in Deuteronomy chapter 7, now come all the way down to verse 22. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee, little by little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But, verse 23, the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, shall destroy them with a mighty destruction, and they shall be destroyed. Now, that's speaking of the Canaanites. And they shall be destroyed. Verse... 24, and he'll deliver their kings into thy hand. Thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall be no man able to stand before thee until you destroy them. Now verse 25, the graven images of their gods you shall burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is in them. Now like I said in the earlier program, they would usually make these things out of a wood base and then uh, veneer it with gold or silver, see? Or, uh, is that the right word? Veneer, yeah. They would veneer it with silver or gold. All right, now then verse 26, or verse 25. Nor taken unto thee, lest thou be snared, that is, by this idolatrous worship, for it is a what? An abomination. And that is one of the Worst words that the English language can give us to show how God looked at these idolatrous practices. It was an abomination. Now verse 26, and this is what made me think of the internet, and I, I closed with that in the last half hour. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thy house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it. Now listen, beloved, this is exactly what our attitude has to be today. I don't believe in going out in the street and march and wear placards and all that. But on the other hand, we have to let whoever that we can know how we detest these immoral behaviors. See, it started way back here with Israel. Thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, why? It is a cursed thing. And sooner or later, it's going to trigger God's judgment, even as it did Israel. Well, I think I will better show you the verse in Jeremiah once again, even though we've used it over and over. Go all the way up now to Jeremiah 44, because this is why God was so judgmental, if I may use the word, and why he was so severe with Israel because they had rejected the worship of the true God and had fallen into idolatry. Jeremiah 44. Verse 15. Then all the men 
who knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. See, it wasn't just the men. It was the women. And they burned incense unto the gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, Pathros. In other words, they, they had actually migrated down into Egypt and took all this immoral idolatry with them. Now verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense incense unto the queen of heaven. Now, every culture had their female goddess, Ashtoreth. Uh, what's the other one I'm trying to think of? Um, Diana of the Ephesians was one, and Athena of the Athenians. They were all the top female gods, goddesses of their idolatrous worship. See? All right, and so here again, these Israelites, these Jews, were offering incense to the queen of heaven, pouring out drink offerings unto her as we have done, and so on and so forth. So I want you to realize that I'm not just putting out fluff when I say that the Jews had fallen so deeply into gross immorality centered around these pagan gods and goddesses. See? All right. So now then, let's come back to Daniel. Confronted with this vile, pagan worship of immoral things. And Daniel and Meshach and uh, Abednego, they just couldn't handle it. And so they had prayed again, as they have before. All right, and so now the Chaldeans, in verse 8, came and accused the Jews, primarily Daniel and his friends, but probably others as well, because most of the nation, you know, has now taken up residence in Babylon. Verse 9, So they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that he should be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the promise of... Now, see, this is what got to them, that these Jewish young people... Now, well, let's, let's give them a little more credit. Maybe they're up to 16, maybe 17. But they're actually in the top rungs of government in Babylon. And so these others just couldn't handle it that these young Jewish lads were in such places of authority, and yet they are flying in the face of the king by not bowing down to the image. And they're staying true to their God. All right. Verse 12 again. These Jews, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, <clears throat> these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Again, I can't tell you what it was, but it was awful, see? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and they brought him before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, Is it true? Do you not serve my God, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the music, I'm not going to name all the uh, instruments every time, you will fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? You see what a pompous fool he is? In other words, even the God of Israel could not overrule him, he thought. Now, we're going to see what happens to the guy a little later uh, in the book of Daniel. But see, isn't this exactly typical of many of the world leaders that we have seen in our own time, especially those of you that are as old as I am? Why, you go back to the Mussolini's, and the Hitler, the Stalin, the Gorbachev, the Khrushchev, the Mao Zedong, what ignoramuses, and yet they were so pompous and actually 
Mao Zedong especially actually considered himself a god to the Chinese? It's not just Nebuchadnezzar. It's so typical throughout the human race. And then, of course, all of this is showing us a picture now of the coming tribulation. Now, I haven't mentioned that before, but I should have. This is all drawing us a symbolic picture of what Israel will be going through in the tribulation over the rule of the pompous jerk again that's coming, the Antichrist. But he won't be a jerk. He's going to be extremely intelligent. See? He's going to be extremely charismatic. And we're seeing a lot of it in our own country today. How one man can all of a sudden get the world to just fall at his feet. Well, I'm not claiming he's the Antichrist. I'm saying he's a prototype. It's just showing us what can happen in just a matter of a few months, see? And, uh, well, I'll let it go with that. Now I'll come back to chapter 3. So verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We're not worried about how we answer. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Now remember, this is a picture of Israel going through the tribulation under the horrors of the Antichrist. That's what I want you to compare now, see? Our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. And if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou set up. Then, verse 19, here's the man's true nature. He's furious. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. In other words, really fire it up. Now I'm thinking they must have used bellows, much like a forge. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind these three Jews, cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Now, you've all heard the story, but hopefully I can pull a little more out of it than what you've normally gotten. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. Therefore, verse 22, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the fire. And the three men fell down, bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said, True king, now watch it. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four, and not bound, they're loose. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And that's who it was. And so Christ immediately identifies himself with these three believing Jews to give us the picture of how he will likewise, and I think i got a minute now, let's jump all the way up to Matthew 24 to start out with how that there's going to be a remnant of Israel in the very middle of the fiery furnace of the tribulation, and God is going to spare them. He's going to protect them, just like he did the three Jews in Babylon. And for that, let's go up to Matthew 24. In the words of the Lord Jesus himself, and we've looked at it before, but it never hurts to repeat. In fact, I guess our letters say it constantly, don't they, honey? Repeat, repeat, repeat. In fact, that letter yesterday, just exactly that way. Less, repeat, repeat, repeat. And uh, I got one from... Uh, a fellow who had been a Catholic priest in a monastery. And I don't remember the details, but he said the same thing. Less, he said, repeat, 
repeat, repeat. Otherwise, I would have never gotten it. So bear with me. We'll repeat again. Matthew 24, when the Lord Jesus is speaking to the 12 concerning the tribulation. Now remember, Matthew 24 is all tribulation ground. Don't let anybody kid you. Verse 15, the midpoint, when things are really going to get hot. The first three and a half years are bad enough, but now it's just like the fiery furnace of Babylon. It's going to be heated seven times more than you can ever imagine. So verse 15, when you therefore, Jesus is speaking, shall see the abomination of desolation. In other words, that Antichrist that's coming is going to be just as an abomination as Nebuchadnezzar's image. And I, I just compare the two to, to the same thing. And when you see this abomination of destiny, spoken of by Danny the prophet, stand in the holy place, read, let him understand. Now verse 16, then let them who be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now here is what I've always called the escaping remnant of Israel. And from Zechariah 13, it's one-third. So the prophecy is sure that one-third of Israel are going to go through this fiery trial. Two-thirds will lose their lives. But here we go. This one-third of Israel is going to flee into the mountains. And he said, let him who is on the housetop not come down. Neither let him who is in the field return back. In other words, urgency. And woe unto them that are with child, to them that are nursing, young mothers. In other words, it's going to be a mixed cross-section of Israel. Not the 144,000. This is an escaping remnant that's going to survive the tribulation and be able to go into the kingdom under Christ's rule and reign and repopulate the nation of Israel. But the verse I want you to see is verse 20. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then. Now watch this. For then. At the midpoint of the seven years. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, and any looks ahead through the centuries, nor ever shall be. Now, for an exercise in your memory, can you think of all the horrors of past history? Why, it's more than we can number the horrors that the human race has gone through. But I guess the epitome was the Holocaust. The Holocaust. Six million Jews losing their life over a matter of a couple, three years. And don't you ever doubt it. You know, I've always told people, you ever have a doubt about the, tribula about the Holocaust, just come and I'll tell you. We, uh, we knew a fellow who uh, was with the paratroopers. And they were one of the first ones in to one of the major death camps. And they saw all the carcasses of those emaciated Jews piled like cordwood. But every once in a while, they'd see fingers still moving. And he had the proof of it because the regimental photographer was with him. And he took tons of pictures. And he had those pictures in his attic. Until one night, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He got up and went down and threw them into the fire. And he was rehearsing that with our Jewish guy. Do you remember? And Eli said, oh, if the Israeli government would have known that, they'd have paid you thousands for those pictures because they were official. They were uh, taken by the army photographer. But don't ever doubt the Holocaust. Don't ever doubt how awful awful it was. All right, but the Lord Jesus said, this is going to be worse. If I read language, he said, there's nothing like it. Never has been, nor ever will be. And so this is like the fiery furnace of Daniel for this remnant of Jews. But in the midst of it, they're not going to be touched. God is going to supernaturally protect this remnant of Israel that they won't get a thing touching them of anything that could possibly be done, and God is going to help them survive so that they can come back and come into his glorious kingdom. All right, so now then this whole concept of the fiery furnace is the only emphasis I want to make. This is a picture of the remaining or the remnant of Israel going through 
those final years of the tribulation with the Antichrist standing over them. Well, let's go back to the Revelation. I got time enough. Let's go back to Revelation and we'll get a picture of their escape. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. Verse 13. Revelation 12, verse 13. And remember, the dragon in these verses are the Antichrist into the power and the influence indwelt by Satan himself. And so Revelation 12, jumping in at verse 13, this is the midpoint again of the tribulation, the same thing that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, verse 13. So when the dragon, Satan, in the person of the Antichrist, saw that he was cast to the earth. In other words, he's now ruling and reigning through the man Antichrist. He persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child, which is Israel, and to the woman. Now, of course, we've got to remember we're not dealing about the whole. We're dealing with the remnant, the third. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Now, don't picture her being picked up by American helicopters or anything else. They're going to walk because, you see, when Israel left, is, uh, Egypt is the same language. I took you and I gave you wings of an eagle that you might escape Egypt. Well, it's the same thing here. They're going to walk or maybe drive cars, I don't know, but they're not going to fly. They're going to escape out into their place of safety, wherever it is, by a supernatural working of Israel's God in this case. And he's going to put them in the wilderness in their place where she is nourished. In other words, God is going to take care of them, just like he did Israel in the desert. And for three and a half years. And then when you come down to verse 15 and 16, the Antichrist sends out a military force to destroy them. But God opens the earth, and just like he opened the Red Sea, and the earth opens up, the Antichrist military, whatever it is, a regiment or whatever, we don't know, but it's going to be swallowed up by the earth. And then verse 17. And the, the dragon, the Antichrist, and Satan was angry with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commands of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in other words, God is going to supernaturally save out of the fiery furnace his remnant of Israel. watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.